Fresh Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome to Cutting Edge Consciousness, brought to you by Hierophant Publishing, Hampton Roads Publishing, and Insight Events USA, books and programs for the body, mind, and spirit. Freeman Michaels here, no Barnett Bain today. As many of you know, Barnett is out of town for a bit. He's going to not be with us for about two months. He is filming, he is directing, in fact, Milton's Secret, uh, the book by Eckhart Tolle, adapted to screen and starring uh, Donald Sutherland. So he's off doing that. But hey, when Barnett is here, we can invite other friends to, uh, isn't here, forgive me, isn't here. We can invite other friends to play. So today, sitting in for Barnett, my guest co host is Clark Peterson. Uh, he's a friend, good friend of Barnett's, and he's become a friend of mine. And now he's a friend of the show. He, uh, for those of you who don't know him, is an Academy Award winning producer who's produced uh, a wide variety of films, documentaries, and television movies, most notably Monster, which, of course, won an Academy Award and starred Charlize Theron. He's uh, also produced uh, Rampart, which, of course, had Woody Harrelson in it, and a little film that I love called East of Havana, which is actually a documentary about the rap scene in Havana. Cool project, and you're with us today. Hey, welcome. Great to be here. Thank you, Freeman. Yeah, well, we're going to talk today about your newest project, uh, The Prophet, uh, based on Khalil Gibran's uh, written work. And uh, I know you have a, a co-executive producer on this, Selma Hayek, and uh, some amazing people in the project. Liam Neeson, of course, is playing the role of The Prophet. And... Um, it's a magical, magical piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. I loved it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got to see a screening of it, and um, it, it's clearly a heart project. This is, um, the movie itself is poetic. That's my experience of it. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, it, it helps to make a poetic movie when you start with uh, a great work of poetry. Uh, and, I mean, you call it a heart project. Um, I call it a labor of love yeah. or uh, uh, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. <laughs> That's the quality in those kinds of experiences. Yeah, you jump off the cliff and you go, ah, where are we going? Exactly. But there's always uh, some discovery in any creative act. I mean, that's what a creative act is, right? If it's really a creative act. Some things that we kind of call creative acts are not as creative. They're just a replaying of other people's movies and other people's songs. You know, the formula, the boy meets the girl, he can't get the girl, but he gets the girl, and I mean, we've all seen it, right? And while those kind of threads archetypally or from a theme can be okay, there's something about wandering into the unknown, and that's where the magic occurs, right? I think so. I mean, um, I'm happy to hear you call it magic. Um, it, we definitely wandered into an area that we didn't really know where we were going. I mean, um, we attempted to do something that a lot of people told us uh, was impossible. They said, you can't possibly right. take this <laughs> this work of, of prosaic poetry and philosophy and, and turn it into a film. Um, but that didn't stop us. And, no, and, thank God. And, and frankly, we didn't know what we were going to do at the outset. Um, but we had, you know, we had a, a, a vague idea of how we could try to, you know, put this out to the world. And, uh, well, you've seen it now, and, and that's what we did. Well, part of what you did was you got resourceful, and you drew in some amazing talent. Salma, of course, um, Liam does a beautiful job. And you brought in Roger Allers to direct it. Now, folks, you probably know Roger Allers as the uh, director of the highest grossing 2D animated film of all time, The Lion King. Um, he also adapted that for the Broadway stage, but he had his hands, I know, in you know many of the hit Disney movies throughout the last couple decades. And so you brought in, because you had the idea to, to do this as an animated piece, right? That's right. I mean, initially when um, somebody brought me the, the rights to the project, um, the idea was to make this as a live action movie. Um, but when I heard that, I just could not get my head around the idea of taking this 
philosophy and this poetry and somehow, you know, putting live actors um, in front of a camera and, and, and creating something. I think it would have been clumsy. You know, I, I, I don't know what it would have been. But, <laughs> right, because it didn't happen. But but uh, I couldn't see it. And yeah. the, the one thing that I, that I did think about was animation because it, animation seemed to be the sort of most poetic form of cinema in, in my mind. And, and I actually thought of Fantasia, yeah. uh, the great the great Disney film, because Fantasia was sort of a collection of separate chapters, if you will, that that all came together as one. And and that was sort of how I saw uh, Gibran's book, uh, which was it's a collection of, of great poems and great prose um, that don't have a ton of connection in between them. Um, so I was inspired by Fantasia and, and I I pitched that idea to the people who, who came to me initially and they embraced it. Um, and then, as you mentioned, you know, I, I got a hold of Salma Hayek and, and she came on as my producing partner. But then we knew that we were going to need a great animation talent. Um, and we literally, you know, looked at, at so many different possibilities and could not think of a better candidate to to bring this all together than Roger Allers, who had directed The Lion King. And um, and when we when we put the word out to him, we heard that this was actually a very important um, book for him as well. And we knew we had found the, the perfect director for our film. Well, let's hear from him. So on the line, we have Roger with us. Roger, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, Freeman. So there is a quality in this project of, again, heart. And it seems to me, Clark, of course, had a, a, a an immediate draw to it. Salma responded like, yes, a uh, heck yes. And it sounds like you had the same response. Uh, absolutely. Um, it was... It was a really influential book for me. I was I was given the book in college and had this really while reading it for the first time uh, with a friend. I had just this kind of shift in consciousness, mm. uh, and it was profound. It was very profound. It was um, I don't know. I can only way I can think of it is is that word satori. You know, and, and those instances of where a Zen master comes and kind of hits you on the side of the head, and you go twink into another realm i just um had this feeling of being connected to everything all of a sudden it was uh, practically an out-of-body experience uh, uh -huh. which was unusual and i've carried that with me all my life so when i got this email that said oh we'd like to uh, adapt this book for an animated film which was a pretty unlikely proposition i have to say yeah but i thought wow i have to do this that's have great to do this yeah <laughs> well there's a there's a uh it's actually a robert frost quote um that i love uh, poetry is when the motion has found its thought and the thought has found words Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's and nice. There, when I watched the film, I got so emotional. Uh, the, let me explain for a minute for the listeners. There's a narrative to this film. So there's a story. And the story is compelling. It's a beautiful story. And, and it, it, it is Gibran. It's the prophet. And it's a story. Um, well, I won't give the story away, but there's a story, uh, a, a traditional narrative. But then it points within the narrative, the poems come in. And when the poems come in, they morph into another experience. Perhaps it's a song um, and even a, a whole different, um, I don't know. It's like your style. Yeah, it's totally different. You go, it's almost like a little music video, like put in. I mean, it's not a music video. That's the wrong way. But it's like, <laughs> it's a vignette, right? That, that may be completely different than the style of the rest of the film, right? Did I, yeah, did I cover that accurately? You guys might want to yeah, help me with it's sure. It's a little bit like going into a dream, as if you're yes. listening to someone tell you a poem and you just shift into a dream. Well, for me, honestly, it was incredibly nostalgic. So I was born in 67 in the summer of love in San Francisco. <laughs> you know, my godmother's brother founded the Quicksilver Messenger Service. So wow. the whole psychedelic sort of thing is in my DNA. And I felt like it had a little kind of yellow submarine, kind of <laughs> some of them, not all of them, uh, had this kind of um, almost throwback. But but it's 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 an update. I mean, it's not not necessarily in that style of right. the 70s, but it has a few 
few of the, for me, emotional qualities of that, right? There's an artistic quality. There's a painting outside the lines. There's kind of a folky, I mean, some of the songs feel like folk songs, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Tell me your thoughts on that. Like, how was it that you guys came to want to, I understand you wanted to collaborate. So you drew in other, other directors, other artists to handle some of the vignettes, but what, what brought you guys to hand uh, the songs? Cause I know you have a big background in the songs, m- making Lion King into a Broadway show and so mm-hmm. forth. So how did that come about those vignettes and the stylized way you presented them? Well, uh, for one thing, that idea was in place before I came on of okay. course, to bring on uh, different artists and have them do these these poems in their own style, which I thought was pretty exciting. And a lot of these people were people uh, work that I admired, and um, and I was really excited to work with them. And the idea, really, with giving minimal notes to them, it was really to let them free, be free to express their own vision. Uh, because that would be the strength of it. And that's the idea also is poetry goes out into the world and everybody does have a slightly different response uh, to poetry, right? Some things will speak more to you than to someone else or even at different times in your life, uh, something will hit you differently. Totally. Uh, for, for example, the poem of children. It's funny because we just screened this last night at uh, the L.A. County Art Museum. And, you know, obviously, I've watched this film several times <laughs> <laughs> yes, in its entirety. But for some reason, last night, the, ch- the poem on children really got to me. Mm. It just struck me. And I think maybe it's because only a week ago, my daughter got married. And I think it just pulled up that whole parent-child thing, you know. Wow. So um, that one really moved me. I was I was brought to weepiness during that period. <laughs> Clark, what did you want to say? I, I know you were kind of like had something. I was, I was just going to add that um, one of the reasons that we came up with this idea of having artists and animators from around the world um, be a part of this project is that we knew that this book was loved uh, all over the world in translated into 40 languages right. um, and that all of these people, millions hundreds of millions of people who've read the book all have a personal relationship to the story and we didn't think it was right to just have one person interpret uh, the the work into a film mm. and so from the very beginning we said let's make this an an international celebration of, of Gibran's work let's make this a collaboration let's find the greatest animation directors in the world let's find some of the greatest musicians in the world and ask them to interpret uh, uh, the work and to and to allow them creative freedom to to celebrate Gibran's words and so what we have then is um, a, a collection of nine different directors I mean Roger was the the captain of the ship and uh, you know brought the whole thing together and he wrote and directed the story and the the overall uh, you know uh, story that holds it all together but then we invited eight Eight other world-class animators to come on board and for each of them to create and animate uh, one of Gibran's poems and so that's why you have this these vignettes uh, as you called them of uh, of different styles and of you know completely different feelings because each of these artists has, has a different relationship with the poetry um, at the same time we also had these musicians I mean some of the greatest in the world we had Gabrielle Yared who is the composer who won the Oscar for The English Patient and is one of the greatest uh, film composers in the world. Absolutely. Yo-Yo Ma. We had had Yo-Yo Ma come and play the cello solos that Gabrielle had written. Yeah, beautiful. Um, um, You know, it's incredible. We we had Damien Rice. Yes. um, Well, he did the bit on Children, which was the kind of folky song that got me all teared up. That's right. That's a beautiful, beautiful piece. That's right. Um, Glenn Hansard, um, the, the guy from the movie Once, uh, and an amazing uh, musical artist. He contributed a song. So, you know, we we did, I think, achieve this sort of international collaboration. There are 12 countries that are involved in our movie uh, on one level or another. So we really did try to bring the world together to make this film. It's so appropriate. I mean, it's so appropriate, almost metaphorically, right? That this is, that, you know, the, the words of, of Khalil Gibran are universal and they do bring us together. 
and they connect us with our humanity because this is my personal take that the big challenge of consciousness is the the recognition there's only one of us here the idea of separation is is what's killing us quite literally from our connection to the planet to our separation of them and us which is what war is all about and the spirit of this project I, I saw it really you know again throwing back to the late 60s the it's it's like the Aquarian it's the age of Aquarius you know not literally perhaps I don't know about the stars aligning but just the coming together in love and harmony and peace and that is absolutely the theme of the movie yeah. that we don't have to tell the story of our separation let's the, the, the prophets big theme is let's tell the story of our connection and and against the uh, obstacles he's facing in the film that keeps being his consistent response right that's right that's right yeah so it's 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 one thing to sort of preach it it's another thing to be it and what I love about this film the more I learn about it you know hanging out with you Clark and talking about how this all came together um, is that it it is a it is this quality of being and 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 expressed you know very deliberately versus just that's the theme of the film and there's a risk involved with that right <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that we were able to bring together all of these people from literally all over the world. I mean, some of the people who've worked on the film, we've never even met because we we literally, you know, Roger worked with them via Skype right. and phone and, you know, the Internet. I mean, it's amazing how you how you can collaborate these days. But uh, I think the reason that, that they were all able to come together is because there was one thing kind of connecting everyone, which was this underlying material everyone read these poems and knew these poems and loved these poems and when you start on a project from a place of love yeah. and, and beauty yeah. and poetry um, you know the people who come on board are, are there for the right reason that's it you know it, 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 it was a natural selection I mean the people we talked to who didn't know the poetry or didn't like the poetry out. <laughs> well, they, they were not part of the team right of course um, but those who came on board you know came to it from their heart and as a result you have a whole bunch of people working on something from the heart I mean to, to quote Khalil Gibran and and in one, Please, of, away. <laughs> one of one of the poems that that we we do use in the film, um, which is about work, um, he says, "Work is love made visible." I love that quote. I love that quote. All right, we need to take a quick break. When we get back, there is so much more to talk about of this amazing, heartfelt project, The Prophet. Of course, uh, a a film version of the Khalil Gibran experience, uh, his writing, and a little bit of a, a narrative uh, uh, um, story, and we will do that after we take a break right here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here. Uh, no Barnett Bain sitting in for Barnett Bain, though we have Clark Peterson. And we've been talking with Roger Allers about this beautiful film that they are both involved with, The Prophet, a story uh, based on Khalil Gibran's writings. And before we went to break, um, you had brought up the quote, uh, work is love made visible, which just grabs me as a way of experience the sacredness or vocational quality in how we approach work. I think so often in life, you know, there's this, it's work, you know, we make work a labor of, I don't know, um, obligation or something versus a labor of love. And that orientation towards labor of love is a reframe. And for me, uh, the theme of how Khalil Gibran touches people so profoundly is this opportunity to reframe. And you shared with me something personal. You shared, and, and it, it speaks actually to what, Roger, you were talking about. Your uh, daughter's recent uh, wedding mm -hmm. brought up emotion when the, the children, the, the uh, yeah. on children uh, started. And you, uh, Clark, had told me you showed this to a friend who was dying because the part about death uh, in the film is so generous to me as a way of viewing death. Those words are so poignant 
So tell me about that story, because I love well, that. It, I mean, it, you know, it's amazing how Gibran approaches death. I mean, he equates it really to dancing and mm. to, you know, f freeing your spirit. And, you know, at one point um, in his poem, he says, you know, life and death are one. And, um, you know, again, it's like it's such an amazing way to think about death. And, and we had these amazing artists from France, the Britsy brothers, who are famed animators of, you know, Disney and, and, and many other things. Um, and they interpreted this poem and created this incredibly beautiful sort of nymph character who's dancing in the sky. I mean, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It, it's really it's really gorgeous. But, you know, uh, this whole this whole idea of, of life and death are one. Um, I, I did show it to a friend of mine who um, who is dying. And all he said back to me is life and death are one. And I could just see how that resonated with him um, because he's somebody who thinks about this every day. And um, again, Gibran just frames things in such a way that, you know, even though, you know, we've all been on this planet for a number of years, you know, the first time you read that, it's it's a, it's a revelation. Well, the material is almost 100 years old and the fact that it's so poignant. I want to read one of the pieces from what you're talking about. Uh, it, from what it is, from what is it to die, but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. The famous quote, it was a... Um, Oh, uh, Pierre Deschardin says we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And that's what that that's what the, those two fit together. The idea that we are more than our bodies, that we are um, the neuroscientists might or the cell biologists might say frequency, that there's a frequency, uh, that there's uh, an us that extends beyond, you know, our physical form. Well, and and I'd, love, I'd love for Roger to speak to that because because, um, you know, very clearly our character in the movie, at one point he just says, we are spirits. And, mm -hmm. and this is all, you know, part of what Roger wrote. But Roger, maybe you can talk to that. Yeah. Well, for me, that was one of the center points of Gibran's message uh, was the whole idea that uh, that we are spirit, that we are not we are not weighed down. We're not confined by anything. All of our all of our confinements are basically projections uh, and, and he talks about that in freedom but um, that whole thing about uh, that our essence is spirit uh, there, there's another quote uh, that we didn't get into the film uh, Gibran says we're more than we think and we more we are more than what we know hmm. um, and the whole he talks about the whole process of becoming conscious you know is, is, is to dive into that depth and, and when consciousness becomes uh, when subconsciousness becomes conscious, that's when our the seeds of our winter selves, he says, the seeds of our winter selves bloom, yeah. and and the silent life in us sings. So it's it's all about. I mean, that's what I find so profound about him, and that's again also related to the whole issue of life and death. Is that uh, we're not we're not something temporary. We're mm. we're something eternal. And um, so that to me is always has always been kind of one of the big messages in, in the films that are the dearest to my heart. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, I, you know, sort of snuck it into Lion King and certainly <laughs> working on Match Girl. It's all, you know, the, the theme about death and, and kind of the, uh, the illusion of the, of the separation. Hmm. I, I, I just lost a, a really good friend, too, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, it certainly sets you back thinking on all of this again. And, and it's comforting to not feel so separated when they make that, that crossing over. I love that. I love that. There is, um, there is this sense of something that wants to be born through us. Yeah. That I, uh, I've talked about a lot. We've talked about it on this show. And that we can take everything that happens from the perspective that it's part of this unfolding, right? There's an empowering perspective, even to the challenges. Often when something good happens, we see, see, it's, you know, it's kismet or it's, you know, synchronicity. But when things that are challenging occur, that too can be perceived as 
from a constructive perspective as, hmm, I wonder why this door is closing versus, you know, having to, you know, struggle against the occurrence. And there's a spirit of that when the prophet gets arrested or the challenges he faces and he sort of approaches it like, oh, everything's held in this context of love, right? So how do I love it? It's, it's, it's how, in my mind, fear gets resolved is that can we love it? Can we love the fear in that moment? It's a it's a test in that moment, right? Yeah. Which I clearly see the main character going through. Yeah. Well, and that, you know, um, Roger, you know, when we turned, gave him this project and said, Roger, please, you know, help us come up with a story to connect the poetry. Because f for those who know the book, you know that there's not a lot of story. I mean, there's just a little bit of a framework that sort of sets up that there's this prophet or wise man poet uh, living on an island and he's beloved by the people and um, he his ship is coming in and he's about about to leave and he's he's sharing sharing his wisdom um, and, and poetry with the people. I mean, that's kind of the, the essence of, of the story. And so Roger had to create, a, you know, a bit more of a story to sort of hold it together um, for our film. And, and he was able to explore these other themes of, you know, freedom and, and being um, a prisoner and, uh, and actually, you know, even freedom of speech and that kind of thing, you know, he, he was able to touch on those. So, um, you know, again, we're so thankful that, that Roger came along to, to really add and enrich you know what was already there. Well that's another piece of film or story is or, and the artist's role is there the consciousness on some level there's what there there would awaken in people because I think it's very easy and this goes back to the the Aquarian theme to fall asleep and to become you know conditioned you know in not the best ways um, one of the I, I'm not positive this is in the film but I'm gonna read it anyhow because it struck me. Um, if it is, I, then I win. If not, well, we'll figure it out. Yesterday, we obeyed kings and bent our necks before emperors. But today, we kneel only to truth, follow only beauty, and obey only love. Did that make it in the film, by the way? You can say, I don't know. Oh, uh, no. I, I, we know it didn't. Oh, 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 <laughs> but it doesn't me. mean that it didn't inspire us. Yeah. Um, but this idea, because it's very much in the film of the response to tyranny, mm -hmm. right? The response right. to tyranny outside of us, but also the, the tyranny within us, the conditioned behavior and conditioned patterning that uh, the character of the prophet uh, so clearly navigates. Because you see him actually struggling in the film with the fear and struggling with what to do next and he he keeps coming back to this grounding sense of it's almost what would love do right yeah yeah, yeah. and and sometimes sometimes we get the gift of it from somebody else uh, and, and that was part of the film as well it's it just that uh, of course this is a discovery we have to make but there are also all these other spirits with us that give us this gift at times too uh, mm. you know um, that help bring us back to ourselves. You know what I mean? Because sometimes we do, we do get a little lost. And uh, as you said, you know, the, we're all sort of, we're all sort of one organism in a way. So it's like we're all working together. <laughs> well, that's you know I mean? that again goes back to the metaphor of drawing in all this amazing talent and pulling everyone from the spirit. This, you know, we say sometimes it's the spirit of the project. Yeah. And that's so evident in this in this one. I mean, I have to say, as a as a film producer, Freeman, I, uh, you know, I've made a lot of movies over the years, and um, you know, this one certainly had its challenges. Uh, again, a lot of people told us you'll never be able to make a make a movie from this book of poetry. Um, but I have to say, you know, uh, some of the movies that I've made, I've made a number of serial killer movies, right, right. <laughs> and and it's and it's really hard to draw upon the spirit of a of a serial killer film. Um, but in this case, uh, in terms of assembling a team and mm -hmm bringing together a group of world-class artists, um, I, I've never had it easier. I mean, uh, you know, Gibran's book just is a magnet um, of, of 
beautiful for beautiful people really yeah. and so again it just feels so blessed to have started with such an incredible piece of material because in some ways it made our job very easy well i love that 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 jabron's book in his work is a magnet for beautiful people that's my quote of the day <laughs> i love that you know again it, 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 it it's not to say that there isn't a place for a film about a serial killer look that's part of uh, i think again art reflects back to us the shadow as much as it does the light right that's right. important to know that those pieces of our collective psyche are there and yet the opportunity to really splash around the light to me at least at this moment in in what's out there in cinema uh feels like a, a, a generous breath of fresh air oh, thanks. thank you thank you i so thought you were going to say in the light of what's going on in the world well that too that too <laughs> wow it's yeah hard time i mean the other the other thing that you know from the get-go we wanted to do obviously you know jabron's material is is complex as much you know it's it's beautiful and it's you know from the heart but it's also you know it's it's advanced thinking it is advanced thinking um, on his part um, but we also wanted to make a film that could appeal to to people who um, who love the work and and are those advanced thinkers but we also wanted it to appeal to, to children and, yeah. and other people who you know maybe haven't experienced the poetry and so you know that was also a challenge that we you know we created this character of a little girl who who kind of is one of the central characters in the movie to to make it accessible to children and I and and I will say you know and, and Selma often uses this example when we first premiered the film um, my three-year-old son was in the audience yeah. um, and and there was an 86 year old man in the audience and at the end of the film my three-year-old who watched it all the way through and was completely riveted and uh, uh, stood up at the end and started clapping and dancing I love it. Um, <laughs> and then in the same screening this 86 year old man was weeping um, yeah. at the end and so you know we we felt that you know in some way we had had achieved our goal of making an accessible film that that everyone could see and, and appreciate hmm. I love it one of the things too in the vignettes I'm calling it vignettes I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the right language sure. the and I can't remember which one it was but I remember there were the stags and the turtles Yes. And Good the evil. yes, and so the I'm understanding the language. What I love about the vignettes is again, it's another way of illustrating it. So, for example, my children would follow along with these complex words based on that because the illustration of where the stag has this gift, and you see the stag's gift, and it's illustrated, and it makes them in one way superior to the turtle. And the next moment, the turtle has the gift that the stag doesn't, and you see where we all are blessed with our gifts, which is, of course, is what is is part of what the poetry is saying. Right. Um, but in having it that clearly illustrated, I think it does draw everybody in to a relationship with this material. I think sometimes too, just even, uh, especially like for children, sometimes the words and, and the meanings of it can, it can just sort of drift in subconsciously. <laughs> you know what I mean? They can be riding along with the music and the images and the words are flowing in and maybe they're not processing all of the words yeah and that's not to give children uh enough credit because i think kids can take in any kind of subject matter i think um and the whole idea that we have to speak down to children I, it really infuriates me yeah but i'm just i just also mean that also on a subconscious level this the poetry and 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 the thoughts of gibran you know can kind of flow through while you're also experiencing uh these uh evocations of it in terms of uh, the different visual. Well, and, and similar to what you said earlier about the specific poem on children, where it, not that it had not touched you in the past, but just based on your current you know, yeah. life, it touched you in a new way. What I love about being introduced to this material, I read it in high school. It was actually part of my reading material for summer reading, mm. and I kept that copy for many years. I don't think I still have that copy, but I have a, a copy I probably bought 20 years ago that still uh, is in, you know, I still have, it, is that at every stage of life it will touch us differently. So the gift is to introduce people to this early yeah. because how many times at a wedding or at a funeral do you hear it? I mean, how many times, or, or even in my own life, when I'm feeling down to pick it up and find something new in the words, that's that's the gift of this kind of timeless, ageless work. <laughs> no, it's it's one of, you know, Gibran's gift to us is that he gave us a book that we can all pick up at any time. We can practically turn to any page and, and 
have something and, and, and receive something from him because it's, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, there's so many different nuggets uh, in the book. And it's funny because, you know, what you say specifically about on children, when I started this project six years ago, um, I didn't have any children. Right. Um, and so, but oh, I, that's interesting too. But, of course. But I, yeah. but I read, but I read the book and I loved it and I, and I appreciated what he was saying about children. Um, but now that I have a, a, a one year old and a three year old, <laughs> yeah, totally different um, deal. And, and in fact, somebody came up to me last night and said, you know, now that we have children, doesn't that poem take on a whole new meaning? Totally. And, and, and it's so true. Um, and, and I think that it is a book. It, there's, one, there's a reason that this book has never been out of print since 1923. Um, and that is because you can vi- revisit it and revisit it and um, it will always be there for you. Well, and that, the part I want to say is thank you for making the film so that children can be introduced to it early because then they can have a lifelong experience or relationship, I should say, with this material. I, I, we need to take a quick break. But I, on the other side of the break, I want to come back and talk about On Children. A, a because it's one of my favorite poems personally. Um, and then also we'll see where it goes because we have a special guest joining us. So we will bring that guest on. We'll talk about On Children a little bit or a lot. We'll see. And uh, we'll do that after the break here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. Stay with us. Consciousness, thought provoking discussions, and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, brought to you by Hierophant Publishing, Hampton Roads Publishing, and Insight Events USA, books and programs for the body, mind, and spirit. Freeman Michaels here, Clark Peterson, and Roger Allers are here as well. And we've been talking about The Prophet. The Prophet is a new film, it's an animated feature film based on the writings of Khalil Gibran, and it's a beautiful film and a very important film from my perspective and I before we went to break I was thanking you guys for making it because again the opportunity to have an experience of this work early in life I feel sets us up for sets one up for you know a really rich and deep uh, resource to go to well, thank you. Yes, we, you know, I, I, as we were saying, we, we, we want people to discover Gibran's work. I mean, um, it was maybe a couple decades ago that the book was at its height in popularity. I mean, it's still extremely well known, but we really want a new generation to discover this work. And even if they, you know, aren't going to pick it up, pick up the book tomorrow, at least they'll have a familiarity. One other thing to mention, Freeman, is for the first time in 93 years, uh, Random House is reissuing a new edition of the book. That's cool. Um, in conjunction with the film, um, so it's available now as well. But um, again, it's we're doing all of this for the next generation of Gibran fans. I love it. And what you were talking about, Roger, that this is uh, this is clearly about consciousness for you. It's yeah. about people awakening to another way of viewing life and themselves and so forth. Yes. Um. <laughs> I, I, this is this is really the whole reason I wanted to join the film, uh, and because that's what that's what Gibran's book did for me. I mean, it was a it, it was a, a profound it had a profound effect on me, and uh, I just hoped that uh, I could put this out there in the world because um, I just think it's. It's something we need. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 I like, again, at every stage of life, there's a place, a way to meet this material where there's a given it. And, and uh, so I, one of the things I want to track is also the love, the love between a couple <laughs> and the way that it illustrates our individuality and our coming together as an offer to one another. Um, that piece, it, it, in the film, it's the wedding uh, scene. And uh, that piece strikes me uh, as well, just because um, the divorce rate's 50%, right? Yeah. It's another place, as you mentioned earlier, Roger, there's, there's some, some hurts in our world. And that's one of them, is that yeah. this love is this kind of codependent love and this fantasy of what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't have the kind of depth and wisdom, the, the love that most people go into. And this piece in particular... Um, is so necessary to understand love as people, as individuals, offering and contributing to a greater sense of possibility for each other. Mm-hmm. One of the things that 
things I, lo- I, I love about uh, what I love about the love uh, poem uh, is is how he talks about how it it, it will uh, caress your tenderest branches, but it'll it'll shake your roots. You know that that's that's one thing I think that's so beautiful about relationships like that. Uh, these intense relationships is is that there's a measure of comfort and there's a measure of challenge and absolutely you know when people don't allow uh themselves to to go with that you know that the whole thing of being in a, in a relationship is as much a learning experience as it is one of you know mutual comfort and pleasure yeah and, and 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 the idea of sing and dance together and be joyous but let each one of you be alone even right. as the strings of the lute are alone though they you know they quiver with the same music mm-hmm. that's that's magical that mm-hmm. each one of us has our own separate identity and we come together in this you know in this gener- generative and generous collaboration of lives and there's a bigger purpose for it even yeah you know yeah i i think um well, obviously, the wisdom of that in allowing each each person to be who they are, and because it, it because who they are, the the resonance, the vibration from that is is what creates your relationship. It's it's not a matter of you know changing the other person so that they suit your your concept of what they're supposed to be, but it's you know allowing each of you to be who you are, and that's. That's what creates this amazing magnetism. I think it's interesting, too, how Gibran's words are very philosophical uh, in this book, but at the same time, they're practical. You know, he's literally, through this character, offering, you know, wisdom to the people of this fictional island. Um, he's, He's giving them these inspirational words, but then he's also saying, you know, in your marriage, um, you know, allow marriage to be a bond, but not, don't have it, you know, bind you. Um, don't, don't um, be close, but don't be too close because you can, you know, you can smother each other. Totally. Um, you know, the oak and, and the cypress, cypress ca- cannot grow in each other's shadow, you know? So uh, again, it's, 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 it's spiritual and it's, it's, it's wisdom great wisdom, ages, yeah. but it's, but it's also, it's just practical, you know, totally. um, which is another reason I think the book has, has become this evergreen that people can pick up at, at so many different points in their life. And, and interestingly that you bring up the the on marriage i mean i think most people today in north america they know the book because they've heard it at weddings yeah. i mean it's it's really become such a popular um such a popular book to be read at weddings but w- what we're hoping is that people will realize that there's much more to this book than than simply that that poem yeah one of the moments of the movie that i really appreciate too is when the crowd is forming into you know a, a mob and the prophet says okay we're not going to do this cuz yeah. that would defeat the whole point of what i stand for yeah the challenge I have with uh, falling into um, almost cliche with movies is the bad guy's in trouble and then there's violence and he's rescued and we all have this high in in the bad guy dying which is very demeaning and I love the way he talks about good and evil that almost there is no such thing that we're not seeing deep enough if we're playing the good and evil game which gets so beautifully illustrated in that moment so you wrote that uh, Roger so how did you Tell me about that, because that's a great moment from my perspective. I think I think this is maybe one of the hardest um, one of the hardest laws, spiritual laws we've been given. Uh, you know, love one another, love your enemies. That's the toughest one. Yeah, I mean, is. let's face it, there is heinous stuff going on out there. Uh, and you know everyone you would feel right in hating these people mm. it's, it's your natural response it's your natural response yeah. but the idea that we have to get over that to get to that place where we can love one another I think is just the most challenging um, law we've been given you know what I mean um, totally absolutely so, um, absolutely in our in our story I thought it was really essential and and of course Gibran is is, uh, dealing with that subject in terms of saying that 
you know when you when you stumble or you if you're slow and and you're a little lost it doesn't make you evil you know and that sometimes Hello. we also we, we also go I, to dark places yeah we do hey listen i want to make a quick switch because yeah. we're bringing on the other executive producer and one of the stars of the show uh, at the movie uh, salma hayek of course doesn't need much introduction uh, you, everyone knows her acclaimed career uh, as an actress. What I want to introduce you as, Salma, is a visionary leader, and and specifically a visionary leader who's operating from a place of heart. You haven't been on the show yet, but we've talked a lot about how this is a project, this project, The Prophet, uh, based on the writings of Khalil Gibran, is a heart project, and everyone involved has some personal attachment to the material, and that's why they did it. So let's start there. First of all, welcome. Hello, hello. Sorry, I'm a little late. No, don't worry. We, so, uh, uh, Roger uh, has shared with us, and Clark has shared with us, why this project is so meaningful uh, to them. I'd love to know why it's so meaningful to you. Oh, my goodness. We need a couple of hours. I know. First of, <laughs> first of all, the book is very dear to me, like everyone else that works with it in the film except Cuevan Gené who had never heard of it but after seeing the movie she not only went and got the book but she wanted to do some research and find out more about the author for me it was my grandfather because he was with me and he had the book right next to his bedside table all the time and I was haunted by the cover of the book and um are you guys there? Yeah, we're here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, my father, my grandfather died when I was only six years old, and it was a great loss for me. We were very close. And when I was like 18, 19, I found that book again. I didn't even know the name. I only knew the man in the cover who reminded me of my grandfather, Elias. And I borrowed it, and when I read it to me, it was as if my grandfather was reaching out to me and he was teaching me through this book about who he was, who he was his heritage, and most importantly, about life. I love it. So I have a very special connection with it. Well, and I love the idea that you're introduced to it as a child um, by your grandfather. I, I want to quote a little bit of the poem on children, um, if you don't mind. Your, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but you're not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. Those words are beautiful, and I'm sure you heard them as a, a small child, but now I know you have children, so I'm curious what those words mean to you today. You know, when I first got the book, um, it was the whole concept of the book that, and the thing with my grandfather, and then through different times in my life, different poems have come to life. Um, when I first read that poem, to me, it empowered me as an individual um, that was, that loved her parents, but that was separate from the parents. It is, it is as powerful for the children and the teenagers and the young adults as it is for the parents, because we also have to take a responsibility um, that we cannot blame everything on our parents. Right. It is, and we cannot expect for them to do everything and solve all our problems and take over our lives. We need to learn also how to fly. And it is a bittersweet concept, but um, there is something liberating in having the courage to accept it. And, and as, so and, when and I first... Go ahead. Huh? No, go ahead. No, no, when I first read it, me, it, it gave me kind of permission that it was okay to love my parents, but to understand that my life was mine and no one else. 
And as a parent, uh, personally, because I have children, for me, it's a spiritual aspiration to really, because every parent has this almost knee-jerk inclination to want to save your children or direct their lives. And what's magical for me about this poem is it reminds me that that isn't really my role. My role isn't to give them my thoughts. My role is to, you know, actually learn from them, which the poem says, which is such fantastic parenting advice, right? Yes. Uh, you may seek to be like them. Uh, you may try to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. Exactly. And and, and that is the part that it reminds us of that opportunity to, to guide them, but understand that they're also a sister. Yeah. One of the other perspectives, you weren't here for it, but we talked a little bit about the perspective on death and actually Clark was sharing that he has a friend that's dying and in sharing this with his friend this idea that we're not our bodies that we are something bigger than that is so generous uh, you I know come from a Catholic background I come from the same background which you know gave me some great spiritual roots but also has a dogma associated with a heaven and hell and I love the idea that we are not that the, the lifetime is not finite and that death is, is, is actually a, a welcoming of a new dance is kind of how it's illustrated beautifully in the film. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I'd like to share a story with you about that. Um, I think our children, I mean, I think all of us uh, are afraid of death. I mean, I, I, um, we, we don't realize how much it mortifies children. And they are constantly worrying about the death of the parents, but they don't show it. Maybe they don't speak, they don't talk about it. Some children do, but they are all. Imagine when you are so little and you realize that this is not forever. I mean, you just arrive here and you're gonna die. It's a terrifying thought that every child is confronted with. And I want to share the story with you about my daughter. When my daughter saw the film. And she always had a lot of anxiety about that, very early on, and we tried to talk to her and things, but she always was a little bit disturbed by this concept of life. And when she saw the film, afterwards she made a poem about how we are free, and therefore we are free, and that we cannot be encapsulated by anything, not even our own bodies. And because we are free and we are spirit, we are eternal, and we never die. And with the poem, we did a drawing of my grandmother, who, she was always upset that she never got to meet my grandmother. She's always asking questions about her. She made a, a drawing of my grandmother coming out of her coffin, dancing as a spirit among everyone else in the family. Wow. And I think that watching this film, he gave her a sense of, she made her peace with this immense concept of death that he has filled with her whole life. He, he, he took away the fear, the stigma, the, you know, desperation that comes with it, and, uh, and it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Wow. And that is the power of these words. And that is the power of this work. Listen, Salma, I am so grateful you spent the time with us today. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Clark. Folks, I want to highly, highly recommend this film. It is a beautiful film. It, again, is The Prophet based on the writings of Khalil Gibran. We say go see it uh, as many times as you can. Bring your family, bring your friends. And thanks for tuning in to Cutting Edge Consciousness.